Hey, everybody. It's Thursday, February 11th. And as you can see here in the aim today, the goal for today's video is to pick back up where we left off yesterday with collisions. Now, if you remember, in yesterday's video, we talked about perfectly elastic collisions. And as we said yesterday, perfectly elastic collisions are collisions in which both the kinetic energy and the momentum are conserved. That means in order to correctly solve a perfectly elastic collision problem, you need to simultaneously solve equations for conservation of kinetic energy and conservation of momentum. Now, as we also looked at yesterday, it's a bit of a nightmare to deal with a pure conservation of kinetic energy equation because an equation that represents conservation of kinetic energy between two objects looks like one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared equals one half m1 v1 prime squared plus one half m2 v2 prime squared. It's a nightmare. And so the point here is the basic framework of the problem needs to be a little more simplified than that because it, that's just too much. And so what we saw yesterday, essentially, is that if you plug in conservation of momentum to the conservation of energy equation, you get a result for the conservation of energy equation that is much more manageable than that big long equation with the one half mv squareds for all the objects. Essentially, what we saw was an equation that said the relative velocities before and after the collision are equal and opposite. And that's a handy little trick because if you're going to do the problem otherwise, you can do it just by brute force solving the kinetic energy equation for one of the variables and plugging it into the other, but it's a mess. It's an absolute mess, an algebraic nightmare. And so the relative velocity result is a nice result. Now, at the end of yesterday's video, I then showed you how you can use that technique to solve a conservation of momentum and conservation of energy problem, essentially uh, a perfectly elastic collision problem. And to start us off for today, I'd like you to try one of those on your own. So here's the problem. It says here a 0 0.060 kilogram tennis ball moving with a speed of 2.50 meters per second collides head-on with a 0 0.090 kilogram ball, initially moving away from it at a speed of 1.15 meters per second. Assuming a perfectly elastic collision, what are the speed and direction of each ball after the collision? Now, because I want you to do this one entirely on your own, I want you first to just try to visualize the problem and make a list of knowns here. So I want you to set this thing up, think about what's happening in the problem, and make a list of knowns. When you think you have the correct list of knowns, I'd like you to hit play. We'll talk about the list of knowns, and then I'll have you pause it again and try to go through and solve the whole problem. So take a second to pause this video and come up with the list of knowns, and when you hit play, we'll go over it. Your list of knowns for this problem may be a little confused depending on how you interpreted the problem. Now, the fact that they mention here that this tennis ball is moving with a speed, notice speed and not velocity, means that you can make some assumptions about its direction. In my view, it makes the most sense if they tell you the speed but not the direction to just assume the thing is going in the positive direction. Now, it says then that the 0 0.90 kilogram ball is moving away from it at a speed of 1.15 meters per second. So if we just draw M2, it's important to realize that you basically have two options for the direction of the velocity, either left or right, and it has to be right. In other words, these objects in this problem have to be moving in the same direction no matter which way you interpret it. Because if you decided to draw M2 over here and you have it moving away from it, that's not how this problem is going. Because if that object is over here going to the left, the objects are never going to collide. 
It's important to realize you can have collision problems where the objects are moving in the same direction, provided that V1, or at least as I have it drawn in this diagram, is bigger than V2. Because if the object in front is going faster, then they're never going to collide. So you can have objects going one behind the other colliding if the one that is behind, which in this case is M1, is going faster. Because then it will catch up with and bump from behind the object we've labeled here as M2. And so your list of knowns for this problem should look like this. As I said in yesterday's video, I think it makes a lot of sense, just so we're all being consistent, that whichever mass they list in the problem first, I'm going to call that M1. So here I have M1 is 0 0.060 kilograms. Let me be clear. If you put M1 is 0 0.090 kilograms, that is not wrong. However, it's going to be a lot harder for you to follow along with my solutions if you are not following the same convention for labeling the masses. I think it makes the most sense for all of us to just label the first mass value we see as M1 and then just label the other one as M2. So we have M1 is 0 0.060 kilograms. I've called V1 positive 2.50 meters per second. Remember, this is a velocity, so technically it does need to have a magnitude and direction. I think it should make sense to everybody as well that because they don't specify it in the problem, you could have V1 as negative 2.50. The key detail here, though, is that you have to, for the purposes of this problem, specifically because of the way the problem is described and set up, you have to have the sign of V1 and V2 be the same. And so because V1 is positive, notice I've made V2 positive. Um, if you made V1 negative, then you have to make V2 negative in order for your list to be considered correct. Moving on then, I have M M2 is 0 0.090 kilograms, and then V2 is positive 1.15 meters per second. So notice that one's going slower. That's okay. That's still correct because it will get bumped from behind by M1. And that's it for the list of knowns. The unknowns are V1 prime and V2 prime. This is a perfectly elastic collision, so the kinetic energy and the momentum are conserved. And that's perfectly fine that we have two unknowns then because we have two equations that will enable us to solve for those two unknowns. What I'd like you to do sort of following along with the examples from yesterday, is I'd like you to go ahead and try this one on your own. Pause this video here and solve the whole thing. When you have an answer for V1 prime and V2 prime, hit play, and we'll go over it. So as we said yesterday, the easiest and most straightforward way to do this problem is to write the kinetic energy equation first and solve for one variable in terms of the other, and then go ahead and plug that into the conservation of momentum equation. And so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with conservation of kinetic energy. And that conservation of kinetic energy equation tells us V1 minus V2 is equal to the negative of V1 prime minus V2 prime. Now, as we talked about yesterday, a key step here in this part of the equation is making sure you distribute that negative sign. It is weird then to write it this way if we have to distribute the negative sign because we could just write V2 prime minus V1 prime. But of course, I think setting it up like this makes the equation easier to remember and also sort of drives home this conceptual point about the relative velocities. Either way, your first move has got to be to set up uh, this equation with that distributed negative. So if we distribute the negative to V1 prime, we're going to have negative V1 prime. If we distribute it to negative V2 prime, then we're going to have positive V2 prime. So that gives us V2 prime minus V1. And as is usually the case, what you'll usually see from me is just out of pure laziness for less rearranging. Because V2 prime is already positive and V1 is V1 prime, excuse me, is in here as negative, then I'm just going to add that to the other side and solve this thing for V2 prime. So when I add that to the other side and solve for V2 prime, I have V2 prime equals V1 minus V2 plus V1 prime. And that's it. I'm going to put that in a box. 
and move on my merry way. That's my equation for V2 prime. Now, as we mentioned yesterday pretty clearly, I think, and hopefully you just did, what you need to do now is take that result and plug it into your equation for conservation of momentum. Now, this one essentially is the same problem that we did yesterday. The difference, though, is that we get much less uh, simplification, really, because in yesterday's problem, uh, V2 was initially zero. And so that whole term disappeared in this equation and in this equation. And here, that's not the case. And so now when we substitute in, we're going to have an equation that really is a bit more of a mess. Uh, and so the second line here, after we write just our general conservation of momentum statement, is M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2. And then we've got to multiply that by V2 prime. And V2 prime, as we said here, is V1 minus V2 plus V1 prime. The key step here is in recognizing that V2 prime is a series of terms added or subtracted. And that means when we multiply V2 prime by M2, we have to distribute. And so what we get on this next line here is M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals, it's an equal sign, M1 V1 prime plus M2 V1. And again, this part is going to look funny because you're going to be mixing subscripts here, but just be careful. Then we have minus M2 V2. Of course, that's because that term is negative. And then plus M2 V1 prime. And so now here, you have to recognize, wait a second, what are we solving for? Well, since we plugged in for V2 prime, now the only unknown in this equation is V1 prime. And we only have a V1 prime in two terms. So that means, and let me just clean this up here for a second. That means I need to subtract M2 V1 and add M2 V2 to both sides. And hopefully you did it like this. And so when you do that, you get these cancellations here on the right hand side. And what you end up with is M1 V1 plus M2 V2. I'm just going to write here plus M2 V2 again, put all the positives first, and then minus M2 V1. And that's equal to M1 V1 prime plus M2 V1 prime. And notice here, my last move before we switch to this next slide here is to just combine and factor out. So I have M1 V1. Notice this is M2 V2 plus M2 V2. So that's 2 M2 V2 minus M2 V1. And then over here on the right-hand side, I have a V1 prime in both terms. And so that means I can factor it out. And in parentheses next to that, I'm just going to have the sum of the masses, M1 plus M2. Now I'm going to switch this here to the next slide. I'm going to just rewrite this bottom line here on the top of the next slide. So if you feel the need to, take a second to pause this video here so you can write down what's on this slide if you have to. And when you hit play, we'll start working on the next slide. So now it should be clear what we're going to need to do with this line here. It's not that complicated. We just need to divide by the sum of the masses. And so when we do that, we end up with V1 prime equals M1 V1 plus 2 M2 V2 minus M2 V1. And that's all over the sum of the masses. And so plugging in here, we end up with M1 V1, which is 0 0.060 kilograms times 2.50 meters per second plus 2 times 0 0.090 kilograms times V2, which is 1.15 meters per second. Then we're going to subtract M2 V1, which is 0. 0 0.090 kilograms times 2.5, zero meters per second. And then we're going to divide that by the sum of the masses, which is 0 0.060 kilograms plus 0 0.090 kilograms. And when you do that math, 
you end up getting a velocity v1 prime of 0 0.88 meters per second. Now, obviously, there are a lot of places where this math could go wrong along the way here in this kind of a problem because, well, this kind of problem is long and there's a lot of complicated math steps. But I think one thing to realize once you've gotten this far is that that answer does kind of make sense. Because just very quickly, going back to our drawing here, if this is indeed the setup of the problem, which it is, then when these objects collide, M1 is going to exert a force on M2, which is forward or in the direction of its velocity, meaning that object should speed up. And M2 is going to exert an equal and opposite force back on M1, which means it's going to have a force exerted on it in the opposite direction of its velocity. And that means M1 should slow down. And it was going 2.5 meters per second. And now it's going 1.15 meters per second. Or excuse me, not 1.15 meters per second. Sorry, I was looking at that. It was going 2.50 meters per second. And now it's going 0 0.88 meters per second. Now, moving on quickly to just solve for V2 prime, we already have an equation for V2 prime. V2 prime is V1 minus V2 plus V1 prime. So we have V2 prime equals V1 minus V2 plus V1 prime. And so that means V2 prime is 2.50 meters per second minus V2, which was 1.15 meters per second, plus 0 0.88 meters per second. And when you do that math, plugging in all those numbers, making sure you're being careful, you get a V2 prime of 2.23 meters per second. And that's it. Now, just as a quick check before we wrap this up here, we want to make sure the relative velocities are equal and opposite after the collision. So in the beginning, we had speeds of 2.5 and 1.15. So that means V1 minus V2 was 1.35. 1 was going, or I should say M1 was going 1.35 meters per second faster than M2. And now if we look at these numbers here, we take 2.23 minus 0 0.88, and we get 1.35. Now 2 is going 1.35 meters per second faster than 1. And that's the point here. Notice numbers that work like this make sense. We have a pretty good simulator here that we can look at. Now notice uh, in this simulation, I cannot make the masses what they were in this problem because they don't go less than one. So I just made the red box here two kilograms and made the blue box one and a half times larger than the red box. So I just made it three. Uh, and then I made the initial velocity of this one 2.5 like it was in that problem. And the initial velocity of the, the blue box 1.2 because uh, it doesn't let you make it 1.15. And I like that this simulator shows you a lot of things. First of all, we can see here that this object, is, which is behind, is going to catch up. It's going to exert that force forward, make that one speed up, and make this one slow down. Notice here that the relative velocity number stays the same as it shows here too, which is pretty cool, I think. But what the best part of this animation is, in my opinion, is this momentum graph, which goes away sometimes when you uh, zoom in. And so I'll look at it while zoomed in here. Notice what this is showing is the total momentum or the sum of the momenta is this black line here up at the top. And the momentum of each object, the red object and the blue object are shown here. And essentially what you see is when the collision happens, notice the momentum of the blue object increases because it gets a force in its direction in the direction of its velocity and it speeds up. The red object slows down, so you see its momentum decrease, but the total momentum stays the same because it's conserved. And that's always going to be how this works. Now, of course, we could also check, based on the information uh, given here, that the kinetic energy is conserved as well. They go through the process of calculating it here. They had the initial kinetic energy of 6.25 joules in this circumstance, which notice is not the same as what you just had in your circumstance because the masses are different. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, they had the uh, initial kinetic energy of the blue object as um, 2.16 joules. And then they go through and they show the final kinetic energies. And notice if you take the final kinetic energy of the red block, 0 0.884 joules, and add it to the final kinetic energy of the blue block, 7.526 joules. It's a little hard to see there with the blue object in the, in the background. There we go. Uh, then they add to the same value. So the red object lost some kinetic energy, the blue object gained some kinetic energy, and the total amount stays the same. Same thing for the momentum. Notice here, this one had 5, this one had 3.6, this one ends with 1.88, this one ends with 6.72, but they add to the same total value. And that's it. Take a second to pause this video here if you want to write down any part of the solution or just make some notes for yourself. And when you hit play, we'll move on. And just to drive the point home and give you the opportunity to try one of these on your own, I'd like you to go ahead and calculate the change in momentum or the impulse experienced by each object. Do not spend any time writing down the list of knowns and unknowns. You already have that written down for the last calculation. I want you to just go ahead and use the answer to that last question to calculate the impulse experienced by each object. So take a second to pause this video and go ahead and calculate that. When you hit play, we'll go over it. Okay, so for M1 here, keeping in mind that the impulse or the change in momentum is the mass times the change in velocity, so we'll do uh, m1 times v1 prime minus v1, we have the impulse as m1, 0 0.060 kilograms, times v1 prime, which we calculated as 0 0.88 meters per second, minus the given initial velocity, which was 2.50 meters per second, and that gives us an impulse of negative 0 point zero nine seven two kilogram meters per second notice that makes sense here this object did in fact lose momentum as the force acted on it in the opposite direction of its velocity and so it reduced the velocity and thus reduced the momentum and to calculate the impulse delivered to the second object we take j equals m delta v and that gives us m2 times v2 prime minus v2. And so we end up getting here M2, 0 0.090 kilograms times V2 prime, 2.23 meters per second, minus 1.15 meters per second. And we get, of course, positive 0 0.0972 kilogram meters per second. The impulses delivered to each object are equal and opposite. And that is because the forces delivered to each object are equal and opposite. That is probably one of the most important concepts for these kind of problems that you will see. The forces are equal and opposite, so the impulses are equal and opposite. Now, the only other kind of question they ask on the AP test that refers to the fact that the impulses are equal and opposite has to do with the equation j equals m delta v. It should be noted that it makes a pretty good amount of sense that if the impulses are going to be the same, it means the object that has a larger mass is going to have a smaller change in velocity, and the object with less mass is going to have a larger change in velocity. And so notice here, the object with less mass, which was m1, 0 0.060 kilograms, had a change in velocity from 2.5 to 0 0.88. That's a pretty big change in velocity there. Whereas the object with the bigger mass, 0 0.090 kilograms, had a much smaller change in velocity. It only went from 1.15 to 2.23. And it should be noted here that all of this works in proportion. Notice 2.50 minus 0 0.88, the change in velocity for the first object, is 1.62. The change in velocity for object number one is 1 1.62 meters per second. For object two, remember, the velocity only went from 1.15 to 
meaning the change in velocity was 1.08 meters per second. Notice here, if you take 1.62 divided by 1.08, you get 1.5. And notice the difference or, or the, the factor by which the change in speeds differ is the exact same factor their masses differ by. If you take 0.09 divided by 0.06, you get 1.5. The fact that M1 is one and a half times smaller in mass than M2 means its delta V is one and a half times bigger because the impulses are equal and opposite. That is a very, very important point. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll move on. So I want to spend the remainder of this video talking here about the next kind of collision we are going to be talking about, which is a perfectly inelastic collision. Now, it's important to just realize here that these are opposites, perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic. The key defining characteristics of a perfectly elastic collision, as we said, is that a perfectly elastic collision is a collision in which the momentum and the kinetic energy are conserved. And so what makes a perfectly inelastic collision perfectly inelastic is something we definitely need to know because as you just saw or hopefully realized in these last two videos or this last one and a half videos, if you will, uh, is that the sort of the concepts governing the problem, you know, specifically the fact here that the momentum and the kinetic energy are conserved, dictate the math that you have to use in order to solve the problem. And so the first thing we'll say here is that a perfectly inelastic collision is a collision during which the objects collide and stick together. The sticking together part here is very, very, very important. They collide and they stick together and they move away from the collision as one unit. That is a very, very, very important part of this problem. Now, of course, the big question that we can ask here is, what is the significance of the fact that the objects stick together after the collision? What is the significance of the fact that the objects stick together? The answer here is pretty straightforward. If they are stuck together, that means that they move away from the collision with the same final velocity. The fact that these objects have the same final velocity is an extremely important point for these kind of problems. They stick together, so they have the same final velocity. Now, we can also say, because it takes energy to stick the objects together, the kinetic energy in this type of collision is not conserved. And that's what makes this completely different from a perfectly elastic collision. The kinetic energy is not conserved, but the momentum is conserved. The momentum is still conserved here because the equal and opposite forces give you equal and opposite impulses, which means the momentum is conserved. But the idea is the fact that there are equal and opposite forces means there's no external forces, no external net force, but there is some work that changes kinetic energy to another type of energy. Specifically here, we can say that the lost kinetic energy is turned into sound, and that's going to be minimal, but some of the energy does turn into sound, which is why when things smash into each other, you can hear it. Heat, which is going to be the most predominant uh, kind, and the energy required to make objects stick. There is energy that is required to make objects stick together. Some of that energy, the energy of deformation, which is what it's sometimes referred to, so we should actually probably write that down. And so if you think about a car crash, the objects are literally deformed. This is what we mean here. It takes energy to crush something. That comes from the kinetic energy originally possessed by the object. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down. And when you hit play, we'll take a look at the equation. So the fact that the objects stick together means the kinetic energy is not conserved. And obviously that's going to have something to do with the way we solve the problem. That should make sense. 
when we solve perfectly elastic collisions, the fact that the kinetic energy was conserved meant that fact heavily factored into the way we solve the problem. The fact that the kinetic energy is not conserved means we're not going to use a conservation of energy equation. We are only going to use a conservation of momentum equation for perfectly inelastic collisions because momentum is the only thing that's conserved. However, because the objects stick together, we definitely need to slightly modify our normal conservation of momentum equation to account for the fact that the objects at the end are stuck together. And so we can do that by starting with our normal conservation of momentum equation. And there's really not a whole lot to this. What we're saying here for a perfectly inelastic collision is that V1 prime is equal to V2 prime. And since those are the same thing, we can, instead of referring to that as like the final velocity of object one and the final velocity of object two, there's no longer a need to differentiate because they both have the same final velocity. They're essentially both moving as one unit. And so we can just give that the general V prime. And that means when we rewrite the equation, it's going to look like this. M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V prime plus M2 V prime. And it should be fairly clear to everybody that both of those terms on the right-hand side have a V prime. And when two terms have the same variable on one side of the equation, that means we can factor it out. And so that's what we do here. We factor out the V prime, and we end up with an equation that looks like this. Notice the right-hand side of this equation reflects both. The fact that the objects are stuck together meaning their masses combine, effectively making them one unit, and they move along with the same final velocity. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, and when you hit play, we'll move on. So I just want you to write this down and make sure we have the terms labeled accurately here. In this equation, should not be that surprising. M1 is the mass of object one, V1 is the initial velocity of object 1, M2 is the mass of object 2, V2 is the initial velocity of object 2, and V prime is the final velocity of the combined unit. Take a second to pause this video here and write that down, and when you hit play, we'll move on. Okay, so before we go, let's just go ahead and observe what a perfectly, or in this case they call it totally inelastic collision looks like. Notice here, I've used the same velocities that we saw in that perfectly elastic uh, simulation that we looked at before. Notice this object behind is going faster. Eventually, they're going to collide here, and now they stick together, and that means they have the same final velocity. Notice if we show the relative velocity, the relative velocity at the end is always going to be zero, which means that conservation of kinetic energy equation that we had from before doesn't work. When we have them stuck together now, this can happen in any combination of situations here. We can have the objects moving in the same direction. We can have the objects moving in opposite directions. Notice here, their final momentum is always going to be represented by this horizontal line here. Notice their final velocity as well, because the objects join together. Now, ultimately, what direction they end up moving in depends on exactly what these initial values are. So just to reset it and run it one more time, now we have this object going way faster, and so eventually they're going to stick together and go this way. The important thing to realize is both of the objects will experience equal and opposite impulses, and that ultimately is going to be the governing principle for this problem. Now before we go, I just want to point out here that notice, based on the initial kinetic energy values for both boxes shown here, 100 for this box and 46.128 for this one, and then looking at the final kinetic energies, 1.3 and 1.6, the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy are not anywhere close to each other. And the fact that the kinetic energy before and after are totally dissimilar is another way that you can go ahead and check to see if a collision is elastic or inelastic. Let's just write down this one final note before we go. This note says here, note, to tell whether the collision is perfectly elastic or perfectly inelastic, you have to calculate delta K. However, 
if the collision is elastic, the relative velocities are equal and opposite. So you can always just go ahead and use that relative velocity equation to check to see if the collision is elastic or inelastic. Sometimes it will be obvious. In other cases, maybe not so much. But that is the key detail. And with that, that's it for today. We will save the problems that we have to solve for this topic until after the break. And since it is Thursday and we have off tomorrow, this is the last video before the break. I hope you all have a nice break. There is a small assignment, really basically just a regular night's worth of homework uh, with a personal progress check assigned over the break. And while I want you uh, to put in some effort to complete those assignments, I think it would be important to note it's probably going to also be very important that you take the opportunity to get some rest. Because when we come back from the break, we are going to go pretty hard here as we make our way towards the end of the curriculum. We are going to wrap up all the material before the next break, and we are going to start reviewing for the exam, more likely than not. And so it's very important here to make sure, uh, while I want you to spend some time thinking and about physics and doing some physics, I definitely also want you to spend some time not doing those things and taking some time for yourself. All right, everybody, that's it for today. Enjoy the break.